Hello, you're listening to Wine Blast with me, Susie Barry, and my husband and fellow master of wine, Peter Richards. You're smiling already. <laughs> yeah, you can't help yourself, can you? I know, but I'm happy um, because this episode is all about champagne, mm. which, as you know, is mm. one of my favourite subjects, one of my yep, favourite wines. Yep, yeah, you never were a cheap date. Um, I should have seen it coming early <laughs> on, shouldn't I? You know, so to all the boys out there, quickly, you know, if your girlfriend is keen on champagne, or indeed, you know, if she's something of an expert on the topic, oh, yeah. maybe even a published author on it, you know, Susie Barry, uh, it's a clear warning Enough. sign, guys. There's nothing wrong with it, but just, just beware. Enough. I, beware. Think, I think that is harsh. I'm from Yorkshire, and if there's one thing we know in Yorkshire, it's how to be thrifty. Well, I can't, I can't argue with that, actually. Anyway. It's a bizarre mix. You anyway, are a bizarre it's mix. Just, it's not just me who not, likes nice wine. Anyway. No, 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 that's let's true. Play, that's true. Let's fair enough. Let's face it in okay. this household. All right, fair enough. So, so, so coming up on this show, we have a fascinating and fun dive into all the very latest from Champagne. Uh, we explore the top trends at a pivotal time in the region's development and talk about the new Champagne with superstar winemaker Jean-Baptiste Lecaillon from Nuit Rodera. This is a very exciting moment. Uh, there is a risk, for sure. But taking a risk is more rewarding in the end. So this is an intriguing moment in mm. Champagne's history and evolution. And, I mean, of course, it's always had its ups and downs. Uh, there was the decimation of World War I. Uh, we then moved to the millennium high and then the downturn after the financial crisis of 2008. But... Nothing has hit the region harder commercially than the COVID pandemic, when sales initially fell off the biggest cliff in the mm. region's history. Mm. Um, and yet it's rebounded with a gravity defying performance in 2021. So we're going to look at all of that in a bit more detail mm. and mm. also ask what the future holds. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, of course, there are the bigger trends too, like global warming. How is that impacting the producers and the wines? Um, and what about the growing focus on the vineyards and terroir, mm -hmm. uh, things like organics, uh, all of which, you know, I think for many years were just not on Champagne's radar at all. No. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, what we might call diversification going on in terms of, you know, wine styles, for example, more and more still wines, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. So we're going to be taking a look um, at all of that and tasting a few you along the way too it's always nice you've missed you've it? missed out one major highlight haven't you um remind come me on, come on. the new guinness world record <laughs> for the <laughs> and i quote the largest drinking glass pyramid the largest drinking glass mm. pyramid yeah so this uh <laughs> how what, can we can, we, only, we can how only describe can we it as a publicity stunt uh, no. can't we uh but it saw 50 get this 54,740 champagne coupes. Sounds like your average stacked. weekend. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> average, average in our house, of course. But stacked 8.23 metres high in a mm. pyramid at, where could it be? Well, of course, Atlantis, the Palm, Dubai. Mm. Um, it was co-organised by Moat and Chandon and it was a, a Jeroboam of their fizz that was poured in. I mean, can you imagine being the person who had to pour that? Yeah, um, yeah. Apparently, though, they, they use surgeons to stack the last few levels of glasses because of their steady hands. Maybe what about we need it later on as well? What about the, the the man pouring it or woman pouring it? <laughs> Good grief. You just wouldn't want to sneeze near it, would you? You know, when that, <laughs> that goes up. You know, equally, you know, you wouldn't. It's a party. What about me? If I, you know, if I'd started busting some of my signature dance moves well, know, near the uh, bit too near the, the pyramid, that could have been there's catastrophic no, too. There's no excuse for doing that anywhere. Never mind a pyramid. Catastrophic for um, many but, reasons. But there was there was something to say that we wanted to say, wasn't there? Before we started beyond yeah. pyramids oh, yeah, yeah. Um, about our competition. Yes. Yeah. Slightly more uh, serious. Uh, this is our giveaway competition with the Cote de Bordeaux from our last episode. You know, we've got two six bottle mix cases of fine Bordeaux wines to give away. Uh, just tune into that episode. It's series three, episode 13, for how to enter and for the deadline, which is the 14th of February. So very soon after this show goes out. And if you missed it, sorry. No, we've had some, we have had some brilliant entries so far. And um, thank you to everyone for those. They've, yeah. they've really made us smile and it's been lovely to hear from you. So if you haven't already, get entering and, and good luck. Yeah, talking about good luck, you know, on the subject of Valentine's Day and presents and stuff, um, if anyone needs a last minute gift or just something to make your life more delicious whenever, um, then don't forget our big English wine adventure, Sparkling Wines, a beautiful Hampshire fizz made by us. Uh, all profits going to the Marine Conservation Society. Cool labels by street artist Hendog. It's all there, you know, and they are available from hattingleyvalley.com. I'm just saying. Yeah. 
Yeah. Just just slipping. Valentine's sorted. <laughs> okay. So never. On with the show. As we've said, this Mm. is a really fascinating moment to be looking at Champagne. Uh, This historic wine region in northern France has, as we've already said, it's had its fair share of ups and downs. Mm. But the the roller coaster ride of the last few years has been particularly dramatic, hasn't it? Yeah, it it really has. I mean, things had been going pretty well. There'd been a run of good vintages and in 2019 uh, there were record exports as well. But then covid uh, what followed has been described as the biggest decline in shipments and sales probably ever seen in the region, certainly as dramatic as the fall off in consumption during World War II. Um, that's from the drinks business. Global champagne shipments fell in April 2020 by 68% and then by 56% in May. Uh, by July, the forecast was for a 100 million bottle decline. So that's about a third of annual shipments. I mean, as it turned out, things didn't get that bad, did mm. they? Um, twenty twenty shipments ended up falling by eighteen percent, rather than the the thirty plus that was predicted. But this was still a big shock mm. to the system. Yeah. Um, the UK imported its lowest total since two thousand, and the overall loss in turnover was around a billion euros. Um, at the same time, to prevent oversupply, the, the regional body, the CIVC, officially lowered permitted yields for the 2020 harvest in quite a significant fashion, enough to mean that only 230 million bottles could be made when the mm. average vintage would have been more like 315 million. Yeah, it's interesting. They're, they're, they have the caps and the organisation yeah. that puts Yeah, they, they, they sort of do this limiting and thing. And stocks. Um, it's a funny old system in Champagne, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Anyway, um, yeah. you know, producers, uh, that said, you know, were actually quite encouraged that they'd actually managed ultimately. to sit to, to ship as much as they had in yeah, 2020. Yeah, ultimately, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, let's face it, it wasn't a great time for it, was it? You know, it was, It was. you know, if we uh, we all remember, I think, don't we, that it was a time when many restaurants and bars had been closed, you know, mm. events cancelled, celebrations were yeah, few yeah. and I far mean, between. You know, you think about that and they're, they're the places when you're going to buy and yeah, drink champagne. Exactly. But the way that the producers read it, you know, given the fall wasn't as big as it might have been, they saw it as champagne almost sort of going beyond its status from before when it was a wine for celebrations and big mm. parties. You know, now it was entering a territory where it was just a fine wine to enjoy at home or in its own right. And so they were actually quietly hopeful that things would rebound pretty smartish after the strict lockdowns. Which it certainly has. Yes, um, it, has, it really yeah. has. So this is this is the interesting bit, I think, probably the most interesting. We've just actually had the, the 2021 figures in and Champagne has quite literally smashed it, hasn't it? Mm. I mean, shipments smashed of... It. 322 million bottles in 2021 represent the third highest total ever. Ever. After, I think it's 2011 and 2007. In the history Um, of the region. You know, exports Mm. have reached a new record of nearly 180 million bottles and turnover is forecast to be about 5.5 billion euros. I mean, this is not your average rebound. This is a champagne rebound. <laughs> Where have I heard that before? <laughs> I think the turnover is record as well, isn't it? It well, is, those, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's a sort of pent-up demand, hasn't it? That's been intensified also by short stocks in, in, in major global markets, partly due to supply chain issues as well, mm. which we've all heard about. But, well, you know, everywhere that, that is exactly. the case, But it? frankly, you know, it, it seems like people are just fed up of COVID and want to enjoy an uplifting drink that makes them feel a bit special. You know, Nothing like a global crisis to make you thirsty, I suppose. Bit dark, bit dark. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, yeah. mm. on a brighter note, but uh, but no, the boom has also been um, apparent in the fine wine invest- investment sector for for champagne too. The Financial Times reported on how champagne had outperformed stocks and shares mm. in the first eleven months of twenty twenty one. I think valuations were up thirty four percent, and that's mm. based on LiveX's Champagne Fifty Index. I mean, that's its best ever performance yeah it's interesting I mean, champagne hasn't historically been a particularly exciting wine for investors um don't, don't really don't know, know why, why. yeah because yeah. yeah. it's, it's, it's you know it's, it's just not maybe age as well but anyway. the one that you think of really. no maybe i think maybe it. also because it's typically released quite late after you know after it's been matured in the cellars not like bordeaux which is released young mm. um, and often, hasn't traditionally sort of um gone up in value yeah, well, partly enormously. Because it's just sort of chicken yeah. and egg isn't it yeah and it's often quite you know drunk quite soon after it's released so that seems to have changed now, though. That there has been contracting supply, as we've just said, and that can obviously spur investment. There's also been a run of really, really good vintages, Great like vintages, 2008, yeah. 2012, and, and, and more to come more to as well get, yeah. here in a bit. Um, and I think also maybe investors have had a lot of cash to play with. And the perception has been that, that the best champagnes were undervalued 
relative to the likes of Bordeaux or Burgundy. So yeah. maybe it was just a sort of something yeah. waiting to happen. Yeah. I, don't know. I think there's also been a, a, a new kind of interest in champagne as a region mm. uh, and a wine. Yeah. Um, now, that I think that's down to lots of reasons, but one would definitely be the growth of the growers who are making smaller production wines that are quirky mm. and, and intriguing and individual. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's a new champagne now. Mm. And I think the, the corresponding surge in interest has come from normal wine buyers just as much as it has investors. Yeah, that's really true. And it's very interesting to say. And I suppose that's exactly what we wanted to get into in this episode. You know, what is it about champagne that's getting everyone hot under the collar right now? Um, so we spoke to Jean-Baptiste Lecaillon, who is Vice President and Chef de Cave, or head winemaker, I suppose, at Champagne Louis Rodra. Now, we do need to, to preface this chat with mm. a, a couple of details. Um, one of the things that, that we discuss in, in, the, um, in the chat with Jean-Baptiste is MLF or malolactic fermentation. Now, this is the, it's a common procedure in sparkling, well, in winemaking, but in sparkling winemaking, mm. whereby the, the, the tangy malic acid is transformed into a, a softer lactic acid. But it's a practice that Rodera isn't doing so much of these days, mm, isn't it? Which is interesting. Mm. We'll, we'll, we'll explore that a bit more. Mm. Uh, and also, why? grapes don't tend to get super ripe in Champagne because it's a cool northerly climate. So, you know, 10 to 11% potential alcohol at harvest is often considered quite good. Yeah. Um, obviously, obviously, remember that, you know, they, most wines end up at 12%, 13%. So it, After know, the winemaking Exactly. So, so the winemaking helps bump that up eventually for, in various different ways. But just, you know, by way of context, when, when Jean-Baptiste talks about 13% plus at harvest, natural alcohol, that is extremely and unusually ripe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, JBL, as he's known, is one of the most highly respected winemakers in the region um, and I would say one of the loveliest as well. Mm, um, mm, he's been mm. at Rodera since 1989. Uh, the, the wider commercial group um, owns other estates from Bordeaux to wine estates from Bordeaux to Port and California to Provence. But I started asking um, by asking Jean-Baptiste what was getting him most excited in Champagne right now? What's exciting in Champagne, especially now, this is uh, the, the terroir of really now speaking more than they used to do in the 70s, 80s, uh, probably um, due to the new generation of uh, growers who want to be closer to uh, natural practices, I should say, or more uh, terroir-driven practices, uh, less pesticides, less uh, more, 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 expre- more singularity, more identity from each plot each place and i think we have we have a re, we have a new generation that is really um pushing um the terroir further and this is this is a very exciting moment and uh, it, within that uh, frame we also have the climate change uh, or ki- which which brings some earlier harvest uh, which means riper fruit as well. Uh, and uh, that is really giving us some material that is um, riper, more expressive, uh, with more texture, with more, more of everything. And this is very exciting to work with this new, ma- with this, with this material now. And just sort of kind of on that, Topic, you know, you at Rodera have, have been um, working with organic and biodynamic viticulture since 2000, so over 20 years now. Now, that's quite rare in Champagne. You know, it's cool, it's damp, uh, it's not easy to practice organics. I think even now, only three or four percent of the vineyard is organic, and, and people have said, you know, organics is impossible in Champagne. How do you make it work? Um, and perhaps, I think more importantly, are the wines better for it? I think I think uh, let's let's not forget that Champagne, like all wine countries, have been organic up to the fifties, sixties. So it's only since the sixties that we have switched to more pesticides, less organic. I think there have been more time uh, in the vineyard of France organic than non-organic. So when people say it's not possible. It would mean that we are more stupid than our grandfathers who have done it for so many years. <laughs> I hope we are not uh, that bad now and that we have improved our knowledge and our 
our fine tuning of uh, the art of farming in Champagne. And uh, we have the tools today, more tools, more equipments to be able to do it. So I think it's, it's not that it's not impossible. It's just that uh, it is possible, like everywhere. But it requires time. It requires um, knowledge, pas- uh, patience. And uh, it requires also to accept a part of risk in your um, viticulture, in your farming, that uh, there is a risk for sure, but taking a risk is more rewarding in the end. So I, I think I see the great wine of the world or they, they, they sit on the link between man and nature. Uh, this is a place and this is the people who live in this place that make the magic happen. Uh, and this link, I think, has been a little bit um, lost in the last 50, 60 years because of industrial and, uh, yeah, the, I think people who are looking outside of there. And I think now we, are, we understand that we have to come back to our land, to our territory, and that we have to uh, make them beautiful first. And if they are beautiful, then they will make exceptional wines. And so it's possible. It's just a question of time, passion, money, and and um, and of balance of your life. I think uh, this is the idea behind. And then this is what I call the pursuit of taste. In pursuit of taste, we try to um, we we went through the organic journey, not to be organic, but more to see how it will develop more taste to our grapes and more taste. To our wines and we quickly saw that the organic farming was bringing a deep rooty root development that was expressing the wines with lower yields more concentration more density mm-hmm. in our wines and this was making in the end a better wine so i mean that's interesting you say that because obviously crystal your prestige cuvee is fully biodynamic and and you have you know you, you're saying there what it gives and i you know i've read you say before you know the precision the definition more dry extract but looking at the mechanisms of that how, how does that work why does it give uh, that it, it it works because you by by going organic you first stop using disturbing the soils uh, we have been disturbing the soils over the 60, 60 last year using um, fertilizers with nitrogen, potassium, calcium, bringing elements to the soil, to the water of soil that was, in fact, just elements. The magic of our soils is that they don't work by elements, elements of part of a wall uh, that is including um, uh, proteins, uh, insects, uh, worms, bacteria, mushrooms, so many complex life in our soils, which makes a specific way of developing these nutrients or making these nutrients available for the, for, for the vineyards. And that's what I call terroir. This is the way the ecosystem works. And by uh, each time we have added some nitrogen, some potassium, we have made the the ecosystem work in a different way and uh, diluting, in fact, the essence of the terroir. Let's put it in another way. If you bring what is missing, what you believe is missing in in water and in nutrients, then you always make the same juice which in the end is is completely the opposite of the story of wine i don't say it's bad because we have made some great wines under uh, under chemistry but maybe it's not as good as it could be just moving on to one of the more, most talked about issues of, of the moment which we've already touched on a little bit so climate change how is it affecting champagne it, it is affecting champagne uh, like all uh, the world uh, now, um, if you are in Napa, you see the fires, 
if you are in Champagne, you see the more sunshine, more ripeness. But we were so much in the north of the ripeness, of the limit of ripeness in Champagne that to date, we can, it's, 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 a benefit, it's beneficial. We, have, we get a benefit. We get riper uh, grapes, better grapes, healthier grapes. Uh, picked mid-September instead of picking them in October. So in good conditions. So in the end, uh, it's, it, it means we have a better quality of grapes. And as you know, in wine, the quality of grapes makes the wine, the quality of wine. So in fact, it's, it's been a beneficial for Champagne up to now. The question is what it will do in the, in the coming years. And uh, we have some ideas of the the target of 1.5 of 2 degrees Celsius within the next 20, 30 years. So it, it, that will change. That will change. And is this, is this um, going to involve changing grape varieties? I mean, I know Chardonnay is pretty ro- robust, but, you know, Pinot can, can be tricky in a too hot climate, yes. can't it? I don't know. That I don't know. It's not in my radar, this, because I think uh, Pinot Noir comes from the Middle Age. It has travelled a thousand year to come today. It has seen the little uh, cooling climate of the 1700s. It has seen some very dry years. And what, what we have now are survivors of this generation of Pinot Noirs that have adapted. So I think we have a pretty adapt, adapted Pinot Noir. Um, it's just a matter of selecting it, helping it, as a grower can do it. So I'm not, um, I understand we have to study this, but for me, I leave the, the change of, of grape variety to the research and development department. This is not in the farmer life. The farmer life uh, is to adapt and we have a lot to do, a lot to do on the soils. There are lots of solutions uh, just by giving more resilience to your soils. Uh, there is, um, we have the chalk on the soil of Champagne. You know, I make Coteau Champenois, which I pick very late. So, um, and I push the ripeness. And still, I have so much freshness in these wines. So, even in warmer conditions, you can still maintain freshness. So, you just have to get the, and that's why I call it the fight for freshness. Uh, it used to be, the acid that was giving you an idea of the freshness. Now we have to find other way of uh, catching the freshness. And it is somewhere. It is somewhere in the soil. It is um, somewhere in the phenolics. It is somewhere in, um, in the winemaking as well. So it's, we have to fine tune every little detail to maintain this freshness as much as possible. And is one of those things, you know, I know you, you don't do MLF, malolactic fermentation, for example, in, in Cristal. I don't think you've done that for, you know, several years since 2008. Um, that's specifically, presumably, to retain that freshness in a way that in the past, probably people did MLF and added more dosage to try and get rid of some of the acidity. Exactly, exactly. I think it's, a, you know, you have that everywhere. We, we don't do MLF to keep the freshness. It's, uh, this is all about adaptation. This is all about adaptation and being innovative, finding the right, the right balance, the right tool to, to catch it. And I think we have, you know, a great wine, the, the great wine of the world today. Or if you look at, if you study all those great wines, they are a, a natural handicap that mankind has taken advantage of. And this is just the best wines, the most singular wines, are not just coming easily from nature. They, they are often a handicap that has been studied by man, and man has adapted to, free, to take advantage of it. Triumph over yeah. adversity. Exactly. And... I'm not a climato-sceptic. I can see that it's happening. I, I understand the, clim- the, the challenge of climate, global warming. But I remain in this spirit of taking advantage of the climate. I've spent my career sort of saying, well, the perfect 
base wine for a great sparkling wine is something that comes from, you know, it's quite neutral, quite high acid, because then you do all the other things to it that make it what it is, the finished product. What you're saying, obviously, is the grapes are riper. They've, in a way, got more character. You know, what we said right at the beginning of of our chat. Does that mean that champagne's taste, inherent taste, is going to change? I think it's going to change, and it has always changed uh, over time. Uh, the, the champagne 100 years ago, or not the champagne of 40 years ago, and not the champagne of today. So, and uh, Poyac of the 100 years ago, what is not Poyac of today as well? That has always changed. The story, the problem is that we, we think, we, we always think in our lifetime experience, what you exactly said, that a base wine should test neutral is the story of the 70s. I can tell you that the 59, the 47, the 45, the 28, they were super testy. They were growing 3,000 kilos per hectare with more than 15,000 vines per hectare. That was really testy, really concentrated fruit. Picking, picked at 13 percent alcohol sometimes. 1959, Chardonnays were picked at 13 percent alcohol in Côte des Blancs in Avis. Wow, high. And yet, the 59s are some of the best champagnes ever made. And how do you explain that? I think, I think what happened in the 70s is exactly like what happened everywhere is that we double the yields, triple the yields. We, uh, and the wines was diluted was diluted and and we said hey, it's about acidity and and the right grapes uh, but that's a story that's a story of the 70s it was not i i would love to have and i have i'm lucky enough to have the, the archives of the house since 1832 so i've seen that i have the the chef de cave writing uh, the full rightness and what he was aiming for and so on and i, I can i I feel that what we are, the ripeness we have today is a kind of ripeness they had in the 40s. Um, it's, not, it's, it's a change from the 70s, but we are back. So climate change is something that can be adapted to and even taken advantage of to drive positive change. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think also his take on how champagne in the, in the 60s and 70s began to lose its way, but is rediscovering it now mm. is, is intriguing. Mm-hmm. You know, how the importance, I mean, this to me, how the importance of having a neutral base wine for champagne is essentially a myth, which is quite something to take on board. Yeah, it's a big change, a big Seriously. reversal. That's what they've been saying for ages, isn't yeah, it? So, yeah. So, interesting. But not, not necessarily a bad thing. So, you know, no, this, is, no. this is the new champagne, isn't it? But, you know, uh, you, on that note, you did also ask him about the old champagne, didn't you? Uh, in a bit we didn't have time to include. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so, historically, champagne made still wine. Then, after sparkling wine was developed in the 17th century, for a long time, champagne was sweet. Sparkling, um, sparkling champagne. Sparkling champagne yeah. was sweet. So, so to, to offset the very high acidity from their cool climate, they added lots of sugar in the dosage of the, of the final wine. So it was essentially a dessert wine. Mm. However, what Jean-Baptiste said was that it was a very, as I quote, very smart move to decide to switch from dessert wine to aperitif, which happened about, I think, 100 years ago now. Mm, that's really interesting. That's a total yeah, shift yeah, in a sh- style Yeah, a complete of wine. shift. Um, but then, if we move on again, and he added that the next step in this evolution is to make more complex wines and target the table or food matching, mm. uh, rather than just the aperitif slot. So, we, so yeah. we've sort of gone from from the, the mm. dessert to mm. the aperitif, mm. and now he's saying, you know, let's match it with so food. It so the evolution continues. But yeah. Um, yeah. hold that thought, because we're going to come back to food in a moment. But um, we also wanted to ask JBL about the new trend for still wines being made in Champagne. Um, these go under the general official appellation or category of Coteau Champenois. Um, they've often been made in the past, haven't they? Yeah, usually for mm-hmm. friends and yeah. family and harvesters yes, or whatever, yeah. you know, sort of home use. Small or amounts. maybe a tiny bit for sale in, in the warmest vintages. But now, you know, with global warming and the trend for experimentation, you know, especially amongst the younger generation, um, they're becoming a bit of a thing, aren't they? The they are. Wines? They are. But, but, you know, but as we said, still wine is more historical 
American champagne than mm. sparkling. So in a sense, these wines have been around yes, forever, so, yeah. you know. But then champagne yeah. became all about the bubbles and still wines became pretty rare. I mean, they only make up, I think it's about 0.7% of the region's production at the moment. But we do love a good niche, don't we, you know. And, <laughs> and there have been a few sort of stalwarts flying the flag yeah, forever, haven't absolutely. they? Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so Bollinger has been making its red mm. La Côte aux Enfants Pinot Noir for a long time. Mm. Um, and then there's Drapier, another house that's been doing still wines for years. And they actually recently released a, a trilogy with some funky stuff yeah, like, you know, that. multi-vintage mm. Pinot Gris, um, a Pinot Noir, and then a white Pinot Noir made from a Solera of 14 different that vintages. sounds really cool, doesn't it? <coughs> Excuse me. Quite a bit of, um, sounds like a lot of experimentation going on. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that's part of what's fueling it, uh, you know, a sense of fun, of experimentation, of people wanting to try something new. Mm. And, and especially because it, it ties in with that renewed focus on terroir and healthy, ripe grapes. I mean, another good example, actually, is, is Charles Heidzig, which put out a set of Chardonnays from 2017 to kind of showcase the difference in expression mm. between four different crew. So we had, there were, I think there was Auger, Vertu, uh, Mongueux and Ville Marmory. Um, mm. So, so they, they was to sort of show the difference in the, in the um, plots. Mm. And then we also tasted a more recent release, didn't we? Their first ever red, which was uh, mm. a 2019 Ambonnet Rouge, which is pure Pinot Noir. Yeah, it was made by, by, by Cyril Brun, wasn't it? You know, and he'd been in charge of making the red wine for Verve Clicquot's Rosé before joining Charles mm. Isaac, hadn't he? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it all kind of makes sense, all doesn't it? All ties together And neatly. it's exciting to see these new still wines coming out now, isn't it? You know, yeah. alongside the existing yeah. ones. It's, it's... Yeah, it, it is. I mean, still wines have become more and more popular among growers too. So it's, mm. it's definitely a, a growth area, I think mm. we could say. I mean, mm. we're, we're going to taste one in a bit to see what, what all yeah. the fuss is about. Well, but um, but mm. for now, we need to go back to Jean-Baptiste because he's been making his own still wines at Rodera, the the homage à Camille still wines were, were first released in, in 2021 from mm. the 2018 vintage and they all sold out pretty quickly. Um, there was a Chardonnay from Le Ménil sur Auger and a Pinot Noir from Murray sur Ai. Uh, but before we get to those, I started mm. by asking Jean-Baptiste about food and what his favourite food and champagne match is. Scallops, carpaccio... Uh, with with crystal with with a young crystal of um, ten year old it's just sublime you get this saltiness singing and and the acidity of the crystal playing with the texture and the so the iodine the 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 sea salt it works so well you know and uh, this is always very exciting because wh- why I like it so much is because it it brings me to a higher level of happiness because it's very alive you know it's very alive it's uh, there is a bit a bit of the sea a bit of the of our white soils as well and this is uh, this is maybe the perfect life you know to be somewhere it's quite a perfect life to me that one yes i yeah scallops yeah, yeah. And, scallops and cristal who who can love that <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> just, just I, 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 I won't i won't talk about caviar and cristal which is a very good match too <laughs> Oh, gorgeous. Well, let's move on to your still wines, because this is another thing about um, the cli- the whole climate change issue, that there seems to be an ever-growing number of still wines emerging from the region. You've um, recently, I think, launched Homage à Camille, the still wines. Um, do you think we can expect more of that? I mean, tell us about those wines, but you know, is, is this a growing trend? Yes, I think I think it's, it's, it's a final. When you have started to focus your art on terroir and you see that it is bringing so much the next step is for sure to encapsulate it as a single vineyard without the bubbles because then you get the, maybe the real express, expression you, you don't disturb the express the, the, the terroir identity by bubbles or by dosage or whatever so I think you can push if if we started this idea of uh, homage à Camille, is because we wanted to showcase, um, like we did before. The, by the way, like we did before, because the last bottling we 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 were making Coteau Champenois at Rodreur, still wine uh, every year, until, and we stopped in 1961. So we are back to the so- story of the 60s. 
where um, we focused after 1961 for, on the bubbles and we changed our farming for the bubbles. Now we are going back and now we can re-bottle uh, these still wines uh, like we were do always doing it, you know, in the 50s, in the 40s, in the 60s, each dinner at Rodreur or lunch, there we were starting with champagne and then we have, were adding a, a still wine from Cuillère, from Ménil sur Roger. So the idea is to come back to this terroir and to show what our terroir can, can give in, uh, in those, in, in new, in a new winemaking or a new old, different kind of winemaking. It won't replace the bubble for sure, but it does show Where we start from? We start from uh, terroir. And this is absolutely fascinating um, to see, I said it before, the freshness that is left in these wines. We have this uh, beautiful freshness. Whatever you do, even if you pick at 13.4% alcohol uh, potential, you still have lots of freshness. Would you compare, um, you know, you, as you say, you've got the Chardonnay, you've got the Pinot. Just, just for our listeners, you know, describe them. Is is the Chardonnay in the Chablis mold, or more the Chassagne Morche, or or is it completely its own thing? Is the Pinot equally a very light Pinot, or is it got a bit more muscle to it? Is it a bit more Gevry? You know, what? How would you describe the the wines you're getting? Yeah, we, we are on chalk and chalk is a, is a bedrock of, of our vineyard. So we always have the lightness of chalk, which has nothing to do with a Côte de Bone limestone of uh, Chassagne or Puligny. Uh, no, it's, we, we are not in the same game. Um, I think we have a specific lightness. It's, there, there is, there is a, there is a perfume, a lightness. And that's a fascinating journey as well, because you understand why we make sparkling wine so good and so light and so elegant, despite of the rightness, because our terroir are producing that. And even if you pick super ripe without the bubbles, you get this lightness, you get this vertical perfume that are unique to Champagne, which is a beautiful um, for, Ch for Chardonnay and for Côte des Blancs. It's a, it's a pleasure because... Uh, you play in fragrance and so on. It's a bit more touchy with Pinot Noir because you need to go for color, but not too much color. And uh, the color, the, so I, I work a lot with a, a whole bunch, you know, full stem uh, fermentation to try to, to, to get some density without pushing too much extraction. So you have to be careful on extracting the, tam the tannins. Uh, in those in those red wine and it's it's, it's 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 a bit touchy. It's a bit touchy, probably because we have to relearn everything, because we are relearning how to handle the right oak for barrel aging, how to extract it the right way, the maceration time, all of that. We start from a white page because we have lost this uh, this for 60 years. We have not made any. <laughs> Can I just take a moment to salute two things? You can. Um, firstly, Jean-Baptiste's take on food and wine matching. It's so simple. <laughs> it's all about achieving a higher level of happiness. I mean, how... Isn't that the cool. answer to life? That is life goals right there. <laughs> I mean, just love it. Also, can I just say, I just love the way the French say bubbles. We can't I mean, do it that way, can it we? Is, it's it just is so the best beautiful. Thing. And it just sums them up, doesn't oh, it? It's wonderful. Beautiful, beautiful. It's but, but, you wonderful. know, but we are it not talking bubbles now, are we? We're not no, we're not, bubbles. actually, no. We're, we're talking point. still wines. Let's stay with the programme. We are, we are. Um, and we happen to have one in our we glasses do, do. right now. Mm. Of course we do. Mm. We do, do. So, so tell us about I'm it. Gonna, I'm just going to give you, I'm going to lead on. in with the tasting now. You go know, on, go, go, go. elegantly pale red made from pure Pinot Noir from a steeply sloping Grand Cru vineyard in Aïe. It's organically farmed, very low yielding. It's a third vinified with whole clusters and aged for eight months in barrel. Um, so this is 
Bollinger's famous La Côte aux Enfants 2016. And it's magical, isn't it? It's absolutely it's really, really gorgeous. Nice. I mean, it's so perfumed mm. and enticing. Um, it's not the most intense, but it's got loads of dark fruit and herbal kind of gamey mm. complexity. It's mm. got great freshness. It's got fine, yeah. chalky tannin. Mm. It, what it is, is a really good kind of multifaceted Pinot Noir. Yeah. That is just yeah. so elegant. In a very sort of a theory real way yeah. it's, it's lovely i mean yeah so this is uh 75 quid at berry brothers and Rudd's, oh, sting uh, in the tail <laughs> for our vintners hedonism feel and force it yeah and it's also available globally hong kong us um you know it, it's, mm. it's, it's available in most major markets there's not much of it though so you're absolutely right the sting in the tail it, it sort of leads on to another general point you know these still wines from champagne are not for your casual mm. value conscious wine drinker no. they come with a hefty price tag yeah Pretty much universally, don't they? Um, oh, yes, yes. And you can get a lot of wine from other regions for the, for, for the same price. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but you know, wines like this are distinctive. They're made in tiny quantities. They are niche wines for people who take a big interest in the region and just want to try everything it can produce. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and as this one proves, undoubtedly, they can be really good. And I think they're getting better and better, aren't they? Yeah. And I think we'll be seeing... And Much as the weather warms up, you know, with, yeah, yeah. you know, particularly the Pinot Noirs, yeah, you know, obviously. Yeah. So, you know, may, maybe the fact that there'll be more of them will have an effect on pricing. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe that's optimistic. Maybe anyway. not. <laughs> you know, uh, talking about price and wine development, the final thing we wanted to ask uh, JBL was why Roderer made the bold and slightly jaw-dropping move recently to ditch their non-vintage brute mm. premiere. Uh, which was about 70% of their sales, mm. and launched their new multi-vintage collection wine. Uh, the first one being Collection 242, but obviously this will then be followed in due course by 243, mm. uh, 244. Mm. Yeah, yeah. They, they refer to the, the, the how many blends that Rhoda has ever made. But anyway, mm. it, was, it was a big move. You know, non-vintage makes up the vast majority <laughs> of champagne sales for pretty much all houses. So, like 80%. So, though, I mean... It? You know, so really, this lit a bit of a firecracker under the foundations of the place. <laughs> um, the the cynics, of course, said it's just a chance to charge more money and be a bit more like Krug, which has always famously described its Grand Cuvée as multi-vintage mm. or multi-vintage, or however they would say it, <laughs> rather than non-vintage. Um, but the way Roderer has made this yeah. move, it really has yeah. been interesting. It is, yeah. So to try to simplify what is quite a complex process. Go on. I'm going to leave that one to you because it's not, it is <laughs> not easy to simplify. In advance, when I fail. Yeah. When it's made, non-vintage champagne is based on the latest harvest. So, you know, you get your grapes, you, you crush them, blah, 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 you make the juice. That's your latest harvest. But reserve wines kept back from previous vintages are then blended in. And the aim is to make a sort of consistent style from year to year. But what Roderer is doing here is deliberately moving away from a consistent wine or brand and instead making a different wine every year, which is still based on the latest vintage and with older wines blended in, but it's not aiming for consistency. It's aiming instead, it's designed to be more characterful and more expressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to hear a bit more about why they're doing this in a second, but in terms of how they're doing it... I will take over here yeah, and, and have a go. So, so, I mean, first of all, they're generally getting riper, more tasty, as, as Jean-Baptiste mm. describes, tasty grapes from the vineyards, thanks to global warming. So in the cellar, then, there are three things that go into the blend. You know, first, there is this focus on using the most expressive juice from that vintage, which makes up 55% of, of this mm. blend. Secondly... There's a small amount of oak aged reserve wines from previous vintages, often from young Cristal vineyards, mm. um, and that gives extra complexity and makes up about 10% of the final wine. And then thirdly, and this is the key difference, a fairly large percentage mm. of wine, about a third of the blend, comes from what they're calling a reserve perpetuelle. Reserve, reserve perpetuelle. perpetuelle. What, what, what's a reserve perpetuelle when it's at home? It's a big store of wine basically. Oh, okay, but it's a big okay. store of wine. They yeah. started in 2020, 2012 um, and it's a blend of roughly 50-50 Pinot Noir Chardonnay and every year they add a bit more into it and every year they take a bit out of it. So it gets more complex mm. every year but it acts as a foundation 
for the wine. It's mm. it's a, it's a bit like a sherry solera. I mean, Jean Baptiste calls it a a timeless tool. Well, he would, wouldn't he? He's got the gift Love it. Yeah, but you know, so oh. <laughs> you've got some you've got some um, consistency, therefore, anchoring the yeah, wine. Yeah, but it, it, it's in always a way, in a evolving way. It's and still changing, evolving and well. changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. So, so the and accent... there's some freshness, I think, from that perpetual yeah. reserve as okay. well. But but yeah. the emphasis is on complexity and character yeah. rather than just consistency. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I guess equally, every new release gives you something new to talk about, doesn't mm. it? Which which uh, you know you don't have with this non-vintage. Is very true, canny in many ways. <laughs> anyway, we've got some here to taste to see what we we make of it. But in the mm. meantime, here is Jean Baptiste mm. to explain a bit more, probably more clearly than us, about this intriguing move, and um, which he puts down to a desire for freedom. Freedom. You know, in the 70s, we come back to always the same moment, you know, in the 70s, very difficult weather conditions, very high yields, uh, very green grapes. And uh, we had to build the ripeness from reserve wines and we create, uh, and in fact, we have to correct the vintage. So we called it a non-vintage. By blending different vintages, we were correcting, in fact, the weakness of the most recent harvest. So I, we, 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 we thought about that and wanted to, we, with the new conditions we have, beautiful years, much better grapes, it's time to forget the non-vintage and make a multi-vintage. A multi-vintage is more positive. It's not trying to save the year by making every year the same taste. It's to use the power of multi-vintage to make the best blend possible. This is why we identified each blend. Each blend now will be identified, 241, 242, and it will be different. That's the freedom I'm talking about. Uh, I don't stick to a recipe anymore. My only goal is to make the best possible blend within what I have in the cellar at the moment I am blending. So it's not a question of keeping the same way. I remember very well 2002 vintage, for example, and maybe that was the trigger in my story for non-vintage is the, 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 the full, all the wines of 20, 2002 were so good, so vintage-like, as we say in Champagne, because when the wine is good, you say it's a vintage. Huh? So that was so good that we had when blending our brut premier at the time, we had to decrease the quality because it was too good. And it just doesn't make sense uh, for a winemaker to, to say, okay, uh, I, 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 to, to be online with my previous blend on my next blend, I decrease the quality of this exceptional child. This is, this is exactly what we should not do. Now, with the condition we have, it's new year is a, is a new child and we can let him speak loudly with freedom more chardonnay one year because it's a chardonnay year let's go for chardonnay it's a pinot noir year let's go for pinot noir that will remain rodreur because rodreur will make it it will remain rodreur because we get the, we source the grapes from the same locations it will remain rodreur because we have the idea of what is a beautiful Elegant wine at Rodreur, and this is our, this is what we fight for, or we aim for. Um, but it will be singular, different, uh, and uh, it will be not a vintage, but it will have the versatility of a vintage, the interest of a vintage. Of, of a vintage, it's a new blend. Let's talk about the blend. You know, a non-vintage is a brand. Uh, when you see Brut Premier, uh, I love Brut Premier, but I don't. Well, what about Brut Premier? Not much. It's Brut Premier. But with collection 241, what is different between 241 and 242 and 243? What, th- there is a discussion. Oh, I prefer 242. You prefer 243. Fine. At least there is a discussion. Because, I mean, to me, though, the, the thing about non-vintage has always been that, you know, you can say, you know, the Champenois have made um, a virtue of it in the sense that you can say to any customer, it's always going to taste the same. You know, it's a house style. It will always it will never let you down. You know, you like that house style. How do you take your customers with you if you're going to tweak it every year or well, not tweak it, change it? Obviously, it's the best wine, but it's a different wine each time. 
how can you communicate that to to your customers? It's 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 a it's a, it's a challenge we have uh, before in the seventies. I mean seventies eighties when we created non vintage, we had neutral base wine, so it was printed by the seller, by the yeast you used, the oak you used, the way you work. That was the house style. So the wine was made in the cellar, not in the vineyards. The 21st century is changing everything. We believe that the wines now has to come from the vineyards. Uh, the wine has to taste the vineyards, has to be, to catch this sense of place, sense of territory, uh, of our story, of what we do. It brings, this is more than just a, a cellar on its flavor on the great winemaker or chef de cave that has the taste buds to make it. It's, it's more than that. It's, 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 it's where we live. It's where we live. It's uh, where our children grow uh, and where we raise our children and our families. So this is, this, this is what we want to show more than, than just the taste of the cellar. Can I just finish by asking you um, one thing for our listeners? Um, can I get your top tips? Um, what are your favourite champagne vintages to drink right now? Probably, probably they can't afford 1959. <laughs> I like very much, uh, at, at the moment, I like very much 2004, for example. I think 2004 is really shining at the moment. It, it has a, what I call a window of beauty, something like that which makes it, um, yeah, just right now. And anything for the future? Any that, that haven't been released yet? Uh, some magic wines are coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some magic wines are coming, really magic wines. Uh, we are, yeah, we, we are, a good, I call it the golden decade, you know, since 2007, eight. we are really, we have in, in the cellar a better vintage after a better vintage so it's it's quite amazing uh, what we have in the cellar i don't I, i'm not sure champagne has ever had such a glorious uh, sequence of vintages in a row uh, and so beautiful wines some magic wines are coming there we go. Great. 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 <laughs> but maybe he not. He didn't go into detail, did he? Maybe not from, and I want to just bring this in here, oh, from the 2021 mm, vintage, oh, which oh, sounded oh. horrific. I'm it? afraid it did. They had pretty much everything, didn't they? Frost, yeah. hailstorms, mildew, rot. Um, yeah. I think there was even a tornado. I um, a tornado. And I think that there have been, in terms of volumes, there's been reports of a 60% drop in yields for, for 2021. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes it the, one of the, well, the smallest harvest for 40 years. Yeah. Um, but apparently it's not all bad. Mm. I've also read some producers saying in the right spots there were some decent wines we will see yeah ever optimistic maybe but we'll, we'll, Glass we'll half see full. We'll, we'll keep we'll keep an open mind Coop on that half full. now we've always said haven't we that life is too short for bland mm. boring neutral non-vintage champagne of which mm. there is a lot. a lot yeah yeah i'm sure our listeners are very aware of yeah. that no but i mean i think we've almost got indoctrinated into it and actually yeah. you know you need you need to break, break free from that because yeah. it's so boring sometimes well not all of it you know it's some no of no it. absolutely some not all of it, it. Some of let's it be is. real you know some so of it's it was amazing really really interesting to hear mm. jbl talking about having to actively decrease the quality was the phrase he used wasn't it yeah of the Brut Premier wine, his non-vintage wine, in 2002. It's very honest. To make it fit the Brut Premier template. Yeah. I mean, that's mad, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is talking about this this house style. I mean, mm. it, it, it does really make you think, doesn't it? You mm. know, we've, we've heard that from other sources yeah, have, too, yeah. you know. I mean, but good wine should have character, ideally, you know, stemming as much as possible from the vineyard. And that seems to be what Rodera is is majoring on now and, mm. and is certainly doing yeah. here. I mean, ultimately, they are aiming to make a wine with more character, which we can only applaud, you know. Hopefully, yeah. that in general, that idea will become much more common in the the new champagne. Yeah, I mean, but it, it does come with a bump in the price tag, doesn't it? Let's be honest, uh, which won't it be does. for everyone. yeah. But maybe, maybe it's horses for courses, don't know. Um, you know, and we do have the wine here, don't mm -hmm. we? To check we the theory do, we matches do with the practice. So I'm just going to top up yeah. my glass. Yeah. I know you've got some. But we always want to hear the bubbles, don't we? 
Hear the bubbles. Oh, I want to drink the bubbles. Okay, come on, tell me what you think of them. It's what's really the, impressive. The you know, yeah. it's really impressive. You can't you can't deny it. So mm. this is the collection two four two based on the twenty seventeen vintage. It is full of character. It mm. really is. It's bready, biscuity, toasty. I mean, I do very much recognise Rodera here. You know mm. that that sort of digestive biscuit and the yellow peach. You know, the palate is rich, but it's savoury. It's very champagne. It's mm. it's mouth filling. Maybe not the most intense, but yeah, then yeah. I'm not sure that's what it's meant to be. You know, yeah. what it is, is really stylish and characterful. Yeah. Yeah. It's a character that I like here. You know, it's not the best champagne in the world, but it's just full of character. Best, best you know, what is best? You know, yeah, what, what are we in, looking for? In, in, in the sort of, <laughs> what do we call it? Yeah. Not yeah. non-vintage slash multi-vintage category. Yeah. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it, it is really really impressive and it just it just tastes, tastes. Of, of stuff yeah you know when there's too much champagne it just doesn't taste of anything you know this is rich and it's golden and it's glorious um i don't think it's so sort of in your face that it will scare people no definitely not the people no, who definitely maybe like not. more restrained styles yeah. it's, it's not, still classic champagne yeah, it is, you know it's not super acidic or super funky um it's sort of it still treads that middle path yeah. and yeah, it's not the longest or, or the most refined but you know, life is too short for bland champagne. And this is definitely not that. You know, we, we did try this, didn't we, alongside another multi-vintage favourite of ours. Yes, um, yeah. The Jacasson, um, which was actually the Cuvée 736 Extra Brut, uh, which you got here. It's, yeah. it's, it's hard to compare the yeah, two because it was re- the Jacasson you know, was really evolved, wasn't it? And it's also very low dosage. Yes, yeah. You know, so, but again, it's just so much character there and intrigue. Character... This is the way forward, surely. It is, it is. So, um, yeah, so Collection 242 is about £55 pounds mm. versus, talking of prices, uh, I think we ought to mention them, £55 pounds versus 45 for what was Brute Premier. But I think on, um, sometimes when they're on discount, on, on discount they go down to 45 and 35, 35 they, yeah. So. so, yeah, no, it's not cheap, but I think it's a welcome development. Um, mm. You know, when you add up what's really going on in the new champagne it's about a region that is fine-tuning its craft and um, lots of people are making good sparkling wine around the world so champagne needs to focus on what makes it different and special and that is fine wine distinctive mm. wine you know mm. stylish accomplished wine um, and and that seems to be what's happening right now. And, you know, maybe accelerated, ironically, by the shock of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, the new champagne. Although I do note in passing that Aldi's affordable champagne, you know, the Verve <laughs> Monsigny at 14 quid was the second biggest seller this Christmas in the UK mm. after Merit, wasn't it? So yep. it's not all about the fine, fancy stuff, no, is it? No, 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 no. <laughs> we, all, we all love a bargain. Especially in the UK. In the UK. Anyway, anyway, we must yeah. leave it there uh, because I think time is up, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, thank you to Jean-Baptiste Le Caillon of Louis Rodera. And thanks to you for listening we're back very soon and we've got some fantastic new episodes Mm. lined up so do not miss out make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and tune back in don't forget to enter our competition and do buy our charity wines if you fancy them here's to wine and here's to you cheers